So, Adarnan Finn, welcome. Uh, just for those you know, I'm sure you know Adarnan, but he is a journalist. He's been writing for The Guardian, uh, The Telegraph, The Financial Times, and Runner's World. And he's also an author. And he's written three great books, Running with the Kenyans, The Way of the Runner, and The Rise of the Ultra Runners. And Adarnan has twice been shortlisted for the William Hill Sports Book of the Year. And in 2012, he won the Best New Writer at the British Sports Book Awards. His first book was named Sunday Time Sports Book of the Year. So we're delighted to have him. Um, but Adaranand also has a website and there, thewayoftherunner.com. And there you'll be able to find all, all about his podcasts, uh, Conversations on Running with Adaranand Finn. And he's interviewed and had chats with many, many different people all across the world on all aspects of running. So please look that up. And, you'll be able to listen to a lot of very interesting podcasts. And Adaranand is also not just a writer, but he's also a runner. And he loves ultra running. And he's had many experiences meeting all kinds of runners in different parts of the world, uh, running with different traditions and histories. And he himself has discovered a lot uh, uh, through running himself, ultra, ultra races around the world. And he's often written about his own experiences of what he's discovered through all the pain, the agonies, the joys, the highs and lows of ultra running. Um, so now I would like to uh, introduce Shankara Smith. Uh, you might've heard her speaking earlier. She's the owner of Run and Become. And she would just like to say a few words about Adaranand before we start, and then we'll uh, invite Adaranand to give his talk. So thank you everyone again for coming, being part of the Run and Become event series. We're delighted to see you and hope you can join us again soon. Thank you. Hi everyone. I'm really thrilled to have Hadaranand here for our first, our first talk of 2021 to inspire us all. The first time I met him was um, with not my Run and Become cap on, but my Shreech and my Racers cap on as the organizer of the self-transcendence 24-hour track race in Tutingbeck in London. And the race was going on and Adaranan came by to sort of observe it and um, sort of said to me, well, you know, could I maybe do this race? You know, I'm thinking of doing this race next year. Um, and I was like, absolutely, you know, this is when the applications open. And sure enough, the next year he was there and um, competed, was brave, courageous, brilliant, as all our runners are at this race. And then subsequently um, in his latest book, um, he dedicated a chapter to the experience of running the 24 hour race. And he didn't find the race easy, but <laughs> It's not easy to find a 24 hour race easy. Um, he writes about the, the experience in such, in, in such a way that moved me so much because it was like reading somebody describing how if I could really well describe our race and why we're inspired to put it on, that was it. I'm not, I'm not a writer and like I'm not as good at expressing myself as that. But he really encapsulated what inspires us to put on the race, what to us makes it really special. And that is, the, it is the achievement, it's the effort, it's the achievement of running for 24 hours. But it's about so much more than that. It's really about the inner, inner experience. And to me, that's what he completely, he, he brought it to life on the page. And I'm actually very grateful to him for that because it's a it's a great thing to point to other runners going, oh, what's it like doing your race? Read this chapter. Um, so for quite a few reasons, very excited to have Adaranand here tonight and let's make the most of him. So I'm gonna shut up now and pass you on. Okay, thank you for that, Shankar. Uh, hi everyone. Sorry, sorry I, I seem to have the worst lighting of anyone as everyone was signing on, they've got these nice, nice glows and, and I'm, I look like I'm in a, a cell doing a hostage video, but I'm just in the spare room. I'm, I'm safe, don't worry about me. Uh, so I thought, uh, you know, half an hour is quite short, so I'll try and keep keep it. I, I've got a tendency to, to wander off in all sorts of tangents, 
But I'd start with a little slideshow as Zoom allows us to do this very fancy thing where we share our screen. Uh, and it's a very brief travelogue through my three books uh, because a lot of none of the books have pictures in. And one of the things people often say is, oh, I wish there'd been pictures in the book. And you know, I'd love to see, see a little bit of that. So, and I'll use that as a way to describe a little bit about the three books uh, as a starting point anyway. So let me try, try this. Okay, so, so the first book was called Running with the Kenyans. And uh, I was quite naive. I, I just had this idea that if I went out to Kenya uh, and trained with the Kenyans, <laughs> I'd get better at running. And also I, I had this kind of mission, a two, two-fold mission. One was just to be out there run with them, experience that, find out what their lives were like, tell that story. And secondly, to find out why Kenyans are so incredible at running. And, uh, and there's a million and one facts I could pull out to illustrate just how good the Kenyans are. The one that comes to mind immediately was I was there in 2011. So that was the year everybody was trying to get the qualifying time for the London Olympics. Uh, and that year, only one British runner ran the qualifying time. And, and there was a B qualifying time, so someone had that, and there was a bit of a debate whether this other guy, Lee Marion, should be allowed to run because he had the B qualifying time and we were the host nation. Kenya, that same year, had 451 runners with the qualifying time. <laughs> so the level and depth and, and abundance of talent and, and is just incredible there. So, so I went on this mission to this town in 10. As you can see, they're quite aware of their, of their status. The entrance to the town uh, it calls itself the home of champions, and in this one town, uh, there's about a population of about forty thousand, so quite a small town, a large village, small town. There's about two thousand full-time athletes living and training. They're not all earning money, they're not all sponsored, but they're all a hundred percent dedicated to running. They give, they've given up everything to train and and live as athletes. Uh, and in some ways, uh, so this is the local cross country race in year 10. Uh, and, and this is a, this is a, like I say, a small town, like a village. There's crowds were, were immense. The, the standard of competition was immense. We had, uh, I remember that day, Jeffrey Mutai won the men's race and he went on to, uh, he went on to win the Boston Marathon a few months later in, in what was then the fastest time anyone had ever run a marathon. We had, uh, we had Faith Kipiego and won the junior women's race. She, in 2016, became Olympic champion in the 1500 meters. We had the world, uh, a guy who had just broken the world record, uh, junior record at 5,000 won the, the, uh, the junior men's race. Uh, so the standard was just insane. Uh, and, and so here I was in the midst of this uh, and, and, and I got a couple of pictures of me actually running with them to, to prove that I didn't make it up, that I did go on a few runs with the Kenyans. I, in fact, the Kenyans weren't so difficult to run with. One, they were incredibly welcoming. So I'd be running along on my own. They'd say, oh, come, come join us. And I'm like, oh, I can't keep up. No, no, we'll run. We'll run with you. We'll run your pace. And, you know, you find yourself, I used to go to this, I met, I had a couple of friends who you meet just walking around the town. They'd say, come to this group. <clears throat> you come to the group. They'd be like Olympic runners, world record holders in that group. And you know they would, as long as you were there on an easy day, you could you could join in. Their easy runs are very easy. I did once make the mistake of turning up on the wrong day on a fast day, and they always meet. Uh, at the, so the group I joined was called the Mishawalam, which is the end of the road group, because uh, they meet at the end of the tarmac road, where the tarmac road becomes the dirt road. So that was the name of their their group. And I uh, I turned up one morning thinking it was the easy day, and it's dark. They always meet just before dawn. And uh, a couple of the runners, I could see they were looking a bit concerned and one of them came over. It was actually Wilson Kipsang who went on to break the world record a few years later uh, in the marathon. He came over to me and he said, you know, today he said it's fast. <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay. And he was like, you know, so I don't think you should come was like the implication. And I just said, okay, well, let's just don't worry about me. Don't wait for me. I'll just see how long I can keep up. I thought, you know, if I keep up for a mile. They were going on an 18 mile run. 18 kilometer run so that if I keep up for you know whatever uh, and so we set off and within 20 meters I was dropping off the back there was a little side road and I just took it I just straight away to <laughs> disappear down the side road but as long as I picked the right day uh, I had some wonderful runs with the with the Kenyans 
another element to my story, which uh, I won't go into too much, is that I, I went out there with my family. So the two of my daughters, uh, we lived in a local house in this town. We, we were advised against it by people, particularly uh, West, yeah, well, not Westerners, but you know, Europeans, British people living in Kenya, saying you need guards, you need gates, you need barbed wire fences. But we, I just thought, oh, I get tell, getting told to live in these gated communities. And I just thought, I'm not really going to get, I, that's just not the story. I don't want to tell the story from this, this remove from it. I want to be right in amongst it. So we took the chance. It, it was a nice house. It was very clean. It was very comfortable. It was very simple. It had a passion fruit plantation in the garden. So it was fairly nice, amazing view over the valley. And we just lived in the local community and it was completely fine. I mean, I do think Iten is probably an unusual town in some ways because of the athletics is such a key part of it. And the fact that I was a runner meant I was immediately embraced by the community. Uh, but, but still, and those are my kids just hanging out in the street with their neighbors and uh, having a great time. Uh, and then while I was there, I ended up setting up a team called the Iten Town Harriers. But I don't think they, they're all a bit perplexed by this name. This is a, a great British name imposed on a Kenyan town, the, the Iten Town Harriers. And we went and ran a marathon at the end of the book where we, uh, we it's, it's through a wildlife conservancy. So we were out running and there are lions and there are rhinoceros and elephants. And, and I did have a close encounter with an ostrich. Actually, that was that I went back a few years later and ran it again. And I had an ostrich come very close to me because it thought I was getting a bit too close to its mate. So it was a little bit dangerous. They have helicopters patrolling the sky if they think the lions are getting too close uh, and they have rangers walking around with guns. But we had a, we had a wonderful day that day and, and this was my team. So anyone who's read the book, you know, the, these are the people you'll know. That guy in the middle is, is Jaffet, the young guy. The guy with the hat at the back, for anyone who's read the book, that's Godfrey smiling. Uh, this is Chris with the bandaged leg. And, and I think you can tell which one is me. <clears throat> and I kind of, so, so, so I had this wonderful experience and the book is in some ways a travel log uh, and, and my, about my experiences and my family's experiences. But I also had this mission, why are the Kenyans so good? What, what is it about them? And in some ways, it's just the numbers. You know, there's just so many people dedicated to the sport. Uh, I, I, in some ways, I won't go into this now because this is like a whole talk on its own and, and usually takes an hour to say why are the Kenyans so good. But there, basically, there wasn't one, there wasn't one fact, there wasn't one like key thing, like, like for those who read Born to Run, oh, you know, they don't wear shoes. Okay, there we go. There, there's a nice, easy answer. In Kenya, it's like everything has just come together at the right point. So you've got this, this, you've got a high altitude for a start. You've got poverty, you've got kids running to school barefoot. So sort of barefoot running is important. You've got the culture that exists there because of, in some ways instilled by the British when they started training the athletes under colonization for the, for the Olympics and stuff. And then uh, Kip Kano in 1972, uh, when he, when he kind of set the ball rolling in when he won the Olympics uh, in the 1500 meters and it was such a glorious win and they still sing about him now and now you get to this point where because a lot of those factors exist in other parts of the world that they've got altitude they've got poverty they've got a drive to get out of poverty but what they don't have is this running culture so in Kenya and it's the same in Ethiopia if you're like a you know a young farmer's son and you've got no money and you know you need to help on the farm and then you just discover somehow you've got this talent for running you go to your parents who say actually i'm not going to help on the farm anymore i'm going to go through 10 and become an athlete most other countries in the world if you did that kind of thing they you know you get scolded and told to get back to work when kenya they kind of have a celebration oh my god we have a we have an athlete in the family uh, and they will support you and they will give every little bit of help they can and then the kenyans help each other as well the the successful <clears throat> runners all have their own groups which they support the young runners coming through so it's a really uh, homogenous system they've got going and it's just kind of snowballed and built <clears throat> built up and and you know it's like i say it's a whole talk on why they're so good but anyways that that was my mission in kenya i wrote the book about it you know all the answers are in there the, the full story is in there uh, and then my publishers were like, well, this, is, this has been a great success. We love the book. You know, you won some awards. 
uh, what are you going to write next? And, and they, they wanted me to write about Ethiopia, actually. <clears throat> and, and I just, I had been many years earlier to Japan. And uh, I knew, I had a kind of inkling that there was a, a, a big running scene in Japan. So I started looking into it. And, uh, and Japan was fascinating. So, so we packed up the bags, packed up the family and, and went to Japan uh, for six months, both times for six months, <clears throat> just to make it easier because uh, harder. We thought, we thought maybe Japan might be a, bit, a little bit easier than living in rural Kenya. So we thought that that's not enough of an adventure. So we'll go there on the train. So we, uh, we decided to travel from Devon in Southwest England where we live to Kyoto, where we were going to live in Japan, overland. So that's a whole story in itself and, and only gets a chapter in my book. I, I kind of feel like it warranted a bit more for the amount of effort that was involved. Three small children on the Trans-Siberian Express for seven days was, you know, when I got to the ultra running, I was like, well, I've been here before. <laughs> But uh, so there's two, there's two kind of key things that are amazing in Japan. One is the fact that you have, uh, you have all these professional runners, like, like so in, in Kenya and in the rest of the world, runners exist on sponsorship, prize money. You know, they, 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 they don't get paid a salary like, like, most, like many sports. But in Japan, the, the athletes belong to teams which pay them salaries and good salaries as well. Uh, a bit like football players in, in, in the UK. You know, once you join Manchester United, that's it. You get injured, you're still a salary. You're still a salary player. Someone else wants you to join their team. They've got to pay a transfer fee. So it's like a big sport. And in, in many ways, the running is, uh, I'd say running is, is the second biggest sport in Japan after baseball. Uh, I thought it was like going to be sumo or something. But, uh, but baseball and then, and then long distance running. And the other reason it's so popular is because these uh, professional runners, although they run marathons and half marathons, the big events are these things called ekidens, which are these wonderful relay races. And they have these long distance relay races. And, uh, and that's why in some way that instills this kind of team uh, affinity with teams because you're not just supporting individual runners, you're supporting teams. So here is a group of fans, basically. These are fans of, of a team Team that I spent many many months with a team called Ritzemaken, actually a university team. But the university teams are just as big as the professional teams, uh, and they have cheerleaders. And you know, it's a big deal in Japan. And uh, the run, the running is. Uh, this is one of the professional teams I was with, Nis Nissan Foods. The front row here is is the athletes. The rest of the people is the support team behind the athletes. So these. These running teams are like, they're like, like I say, it's like Manchester United or Liverpool, you know, it's, it's a big operation. You might notice a, a Kenyan guy in the front row there. They all go and they scout Kenyan runners, like much like the British teams used to go and scout Brazilian or Argentinian football players. Uh, and so there's this wonderful uh, kind of fervor for running in Japan and, and they're absolutely obsessed by it. And, uh, and they're very good at it as well. So uh, I'll pick a random, so, so, so a kind of illustration of just how good they are in Japan. And weirdly in Japan, because the Ekidens are usually around about half marathon distance per leg, the kind of best distance in Japan is like the half marathon. So they're very good at marathon. The marathon record is like 206, but the, the, ha the half marathon is the key distance there. And uh, these are just some guys doing a time trial. But uh, we had, uh, it was actually a few months after I came back, the British Half Marathon Championships were on, and it was to pick the team for the World Half Marathon Championships, which were on that year in Cardiff. So it was quite a big deal. And they were saying, this is like the best gathering of British runners we've ever had in a half marathon. So, uh, so, 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 so everyone was there except Mo Farah, and the winning, the winning time was about 64 and a half minutes. Now that same exact day in Japan, they had uh, the Japanese University Half Marathon Championships. So these are just university runners, none of the professional runners. And that British guy running in 64 and a half minutes, he wouldn't have finished in the top 100 that day in, in Japan. So the level, the depth of talent is incredible in Japan too. So I had, so like with each book, I had this kind of mission. One is to tell the story of what's going on. 
And secondly, you know, sorry, with Kenya, it was why are they so good? So in Japan, it was a little bit why are they so good, but just what the hell is going on in Japan? What is this Ekiden? You know, what is the scene in Japan? Uh, this is a guy, and, and they're great. This guy, this is Yuki Kauchi, who won the Boston Marathon a couple of years ago. I mean, they're very good. There was a side story in Japan, uh, which, which potentially led me on inadvertently to the ultra marathons. Uh, and this is, some people may have heard of these guys. These are Tendai Buddhist monks. <clears throat> and they embark on this challenge, which is to run, it's, it, it, it's not strictly, but it roughly equates to 1,000 marathons in 1,000 days. And they run it around this mountain in, it's called Mount Hie, just outside Kyoto. And they actually start off running about 20 miles a day and they end up running about 60 miles a day. So on it, it averages up. And in over 400 years, this challenge has been there to, to be undertaken. And 40 men have ever completed it. And this, this was one of the 40 men in 400 years who'd, who'd finished that challenge. So I, they're very hard to get to meet. So I managed to get to meet him and, and talk to him. And, and I won't spoil it, but it's a very entertaining part of the book because he, uh, he's very, he, he, I, I can never quite tell if he's playing with me or being serious, but he's not what I was expecting. Uh, but but he's, he, he is very interesting. And uh, anyways, that led me on to a third book, not necessarily directly, but then next thing I found out, I was running across deserts. I was in tooting. <laughs> Here's me. Here's me at the start of running 24 hours around a running track, which is the race uh, the running become team organize, uh, the self-transcendence 24 hour race. And it's a brilliant name because in some ways, self-transcendence is what encapsulates ultra running, not just this kind of ultra running, but all ultra running in general is, is that you get to a point, or, or at least I did, and I think most people do. I mean, I kind of wrote this book and thought, is this just me? Is this, you know, is this gonna resonate with people? But People read this book and go, oh my God, this just captures how I feel. And in almost every race, you get to a crisis point where you just cannot go on. If you're running more than 50 miles, you're going to get to a point where you just, you just, your brain can't compute. Why am I still going? Why am I doing this to myself? And, uh, and, and actually, there's a picture of me probably at that point about it. <laughs> That's probably the most intense space I think I've ever seen on myself. And that's about two in the morning. Uh, and I, I really didn't want to carry on at that point. And then somehow you get through it. And, and not always, of course, a lot of people drop out of races. Often what's interesting when people do drop out of races, then they feel this need to go back. Uh, uh, they don't like to be beaten by a race. Uh, and people can go back many times to try and complete a race. But there's that sense of going beyond what you, you finding this point where you cannot carry on, you really cannot carry on, and then you do. And then you kind of carry that strength, that kind of understanding with you in, into the rest of your life that, wow, I'm, I'm, I've been in tough situations before. I'm stronger than I thought. I don't have to think, oh, I can only run, you know, 100 miles or 24 hours seems like impossible. But actually, if you just keep going one step at a time, you'll get to a point where you'll think it's stupid. You won't want to do it. But somehow, I mean, in most cases, you can. <laughs> And so I ran in all these wonderful places. Uh, this is in the Dolomites in Italy. And I ended up the book uh, running the UTMB, which is 105 miles around Mont Blanc in, in the Alps. So that's the end of my slideshow, I think. Yeah. So that's a, that's a kind of rather whistle stop, but fairly lengthy uh, uh, whiz through my three books. Uh, and you can ask me after, finish you can ask me about any element of that and I can attempt to answer but I kind of felt like what, what should I talk about because there's obviously so many different subjects within all of that uh, and I feel like one thing people often want to know is like you know you, you sign up for these things one thing you quite like to know is something that can help you become a better runner or help you with your own running uh, and in particularly, obviously, the Kenyans were the best runners. The Kenyans are the inspirations, the, the, the people, you know, we all would love to run like a Kenyan. But a lot of what makes them great runners is very hard to emulate. You know, the, the growing up, running around everywhere, barefoot, living in poverty, living at altitude, you know, having this incredible groups to run around everywhere with, to be inspired by, to be elevated by. Uh, and so, 
the, the but there are but even even saying that there are a couple of things we can learn and 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 there was one moment actually that came in Japan which I think encapsulates some really interesting lessons uh, and yeah so so what happens in Japan I said these Ekiden teams they they sign up Kenyan runners uh, or Ethiopian runners sometimes there aren't there there's a limit on how many they can have I think it's one per team but then often they sign up too so they've got a friend there anyways I ended up meeting this uh Kenyan guy on one of these Ekiden teams in Japan and I was there trying to work out why the Japanese were so good why they you know they had a hundred guys faster at half marathon than than, than our hundred students faster than our top British guy at, that race excluded Mo Farah, by the way, I should, I should say, because obviously he could run quicker than 64 minutes. Uh, and a few other British runners these days can as well. But, but at that moment, in that moment in time, uh, and, and he turned it all on his head because I, I actually met him at one of the Ekiden races and he's, he, was, he was amazed by the Japanese system and the Japanese, he was actually at college there. So he hadn't become a pro yet. But he said, you know, the, the fervor and the passion for running here is incredible, way more than Kenya. He said, and, and, and then there's one line that kind of flips my whole body. He said, if the Japanese train like the Kenyans, they'd break all the world records. And I was like, whoa, that's, that's quite a big statement. Uh, and, and also when you talk to the Japanese about, because they, they had a very different way of training to the Kenyans. And I would often say, you know, what about, you know, you learn from the Kenyans, you ask them, you, each team has got a couple of Kenyans, why don't you kind of emulate them a little bit? And they would say, oh no, the Kenyans are just different. You know, the Kenyans, we can't compete with the Kenyans. They're like, they're just different. But I, you know, I looked in, in my book, Running with the Kenyans, I looked into it and there is no, there is no genetic, or at least not known. I mean, there could potentially be, genetics is a very new discipline that we know there's a lot of unknowns there. But, but the people have studied this and as much as, as far as they can tell, there's no dis, uh, unique genetic distinction that is more prevalent in East Africa than anywhere else. Uh, that, that, that helps you with long distance running. Uh, and so I was kind of intrigued by this point. If the, if the Japanese train like the Kenyans, and you'll see the next question is, what's wrong with the training? Or you know, what, what are they doing wrong in the training? And, and his answer was brilliant. He said, they train too hard. And, and, you know, that wasn't what I was expecting. You know, I was, you know, we have this idea and the Japanese really have this idea and we have it too, is that if you, you want to be successful, you work hard, right? Yeah, and then if you're, if it's not working, you're not working hard enough, you need to work harder and you need to push harder and you need to, you know, apply yourself more. And, uh, and the Kenyans were saying, no, they, they train, you know, they, they, uh, they're training too hard. And, and in some ways, I mean, I, once, I was once with uh, Jeffrey Camelwar, who's six time world champion and uh, has broken, he's not, no longer, but he was the half marathon world record holder. And I said, what's, what's the best bit of advice you can give me? And he said, train hard, but not every day. And there's two elements to that. And so, so there is still the train hard. So they're not saying, oh, just sit around all day, you know, and you'll get better at running. There is still the train hard, and Kenyans definitely are not lazy, and they train very hard. But they don't train unbelievably hard like the Japanese do. The Japanese are out three times a day. They're pushing, pushing, pushing. What happens is they're not training smart. It means they're never fresh for the for the key sessions. They're never, you know, they're not doing any of this recovery running, which is which the Kenyans do a lot of. So I said I went out there and I managed to keep up with them on the easy runs. That's because their easy runs are super slow. I mean, I work in miles. A minutes per mile but we're doing like nine ten minutes per mile which is even for me or for probably most people is a fairly slow jog uh and 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 so and the other thing they do is they rest they rest. the kenyans spend all their day you know lounging around doing nothing the kenyan athletes uh of course you know unless you're an elite athlete you can't do that but you can take that kind of lesson on board and you think you know I, I can go to bed earlier. I can have days where I run slower. And the other thing they do is is they have they they have fun with it as well. And these easy runs because they're so easy. There's a lot of banter going on between the the runners. They're having fun, and it really reminds me. There was a story I heard about these Brazilian footballers who went to America to do soccer. You know, football, and uh, they were with the training camps. And and one of the Americans had this T-shirt, "No easy days." 
And apparently the Brazilians didn't understand that because every day was easy when you're a footballer. I mean, that's that is the easy life. And it's because they had this joy with the football. And uh, I've just read this great book, which is a bit like Running with the Kenyans, but about Ethiopia, the book I didn't write, uh, called uh, Out of Thin Air. So I, I recommend that if you if you read all mine. <laughs> uh, but he talks about how the Ethiopian runners, they, they kind of turn the game into this, the, the run into this game of follow me leader. They run one behind the other. They look for the most difficult terrain. They leap over things. And he said a lot of it is they're just making it fun. They're just out for training, having fun. And so this idea that, you know, to be good at running, you've got to work hard. You've got to slog, slog it out. And, and the Japanese are particularly bad at this. You know, if you're not working hard, you know, it's not honorable. I mean, you've got to, you've got to be slogging yourself to death. And they actually, I mean, there's a whole whole thing about the Japanese when they finish the race, they have to show how how hard they've been working. And there's all these incredible photos of them crossing the line, they collapse and they have uh, gas and air at, at the finish because it's, it's just all so dramatic. And all they're trying to do is show how much I've been trying. I'm trying really hard. And, uh, and the fun is just kind of lost. And so the Kenyans, the Ethiopians, the Brazilian footballers, they just take it a bit easier. And, and I think at this time now with the pandemic, there's maybe, you know, maybe you're thinking, oh, yeah, I should be out every day. I should be pushing it. I've got time. But maybe it's difficult. You know, maybe it's like hard to motivate yourself. And maybe I think there is a lesson there that you don't have, you know, there's a, there's a fine line. You don't want, you know, there's a fine line between being lazy and being good to yourself. And I think the Kenyans, partly because the stakes are so high, they're, not, they're never going to be lazy. They're never going to go just because they can't be bothered. They're doing it consciously. They're kind of, a, with awareness, they're taking time out. They're enjoying it. They're having fun with it because they know that that's how they're going to avoid injury. That's how they're going to run better. That's how they're going to maintain this form over a longer period of time. So I think that's a, a, a really interesting lesson to take for, from that. And, and uh, he did actually say, when I said, what's wrong with the, with the training? There were two things. So one was, they train too hard. And the second thing, he, the way he described it, he just said, no forest. <clears throat> and uh, what he meant, and, and a couple of Ethiopians I met later repeated the same complaint, the same two complaints, actually. The way they expressed it was, again, no forest. And they said too much, uh, not, no speed work, is what they said. And that was kind of the same thing as training too hard, because the Japanese are always pushing themselves. Every run, they have to push themselves. It means they're never fresh for the speed work, which the Kenyans and the Ethiopians, they'll go really slow. And then, like I say, you turn up on the fast day, it's really fast. You know, these guys are, I've been with them on, on you know, 35 kilometer runs where they're running, you know, under five minutes a mile at altitude on dirt roads. I mean, they, they can, obviously they can move and they work hard when the moment comes. Uh, but they do it all on trails. The Kenyans and the Ethiopians do all, well, I wouldn't say all of it, but 90% of their running on the trails. So when he said no forest, this is what he meant. He meant in Japan, they do all the running on concrete. And this is just a kind of, I mean, there are trail runners in Japan uh, and, and, and there is a whole trail running scene. And that's very separate from the world I was inhabiting, which was the professional runners, the professional Ekidem runners. So the professional runners do all their training on the concrete. They kind of feel like they're racing on the concrete. They should train on the concrete. They're also slightly in fear of the trails. Uh, I had one coach tell me, because I, 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 he was questioning me a lot about the Kenyans. And I said, well, you know, they do all the training on the trail. You live by the forest. This was in Kyoto. There's mountains all around Kyoto. Take, them, take your runners on the trail. And he was like, if I took my runners up there, I'd be sacked. My bosses would say, what are you doing? You're crazy. You know, someone could trip on a tree root, get injured. The irony was they were injured all the time. His team, half his team was injured. Half, every, every Japanese from the amateur groups to the professional groups I went to, the, the university groups, everybody was either recovering from an injury, had an injury, where then, I mean, it's only anecdotal. I don't have statistics, but in all the groups I was with in Kenya, the odd injury here and there, but most people were fine. I mean, they were training hard but they were resting, they were recovering, they were sleeping and they were training on the trails. And I just think those, that moment where he said, if you train like the Kenyans, and I, I kind of wanted, you know, the Japanese to kind of, I wanted to tell the Japanese this. And my book did come out in, in Japanese actually. And uh, 
so that message did get <clears throat> to someone. I've no idea how well it sold out there or how many, if it had any impact at all. Although I do know that a couple of the uh, recent Hakone Ekiden, which is the big one, coaches have been very kind of pro. And so, so there's this kind of old school Japanese way, which is the old fashioned way, which is just like slog your runners to death and shout at them and scream at them. And if they don't do it, you know, you just hit them with a stick or something. Whereas the, what, they, what they call the new, the new coaches with new ideas in, in Japan uh, are much more touchy-feely. They let the athletes have days off. You know, they want it to be fun. That's considered like touchy-feely, slightly new, newfangled to have fun while you're, while you're training. Uh, I've got no idea whether I had any influence on that at all because no one has ever said I, I had. So I probably didn't, but uh, that was the message I was... Uh, trying to share with them and and which I share in my book so yeah so the one kind of lesson I think you can take away from the Kenyans is run your slow runs easy you know rest as much as you can I mean we don't probably well maybe in lockdown some people have got more time to rest put your feet up uh work hard but not every day and, and have fun with it and, and 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 find a trail if you can I know a lot of you probably uh well maybe maybe not a lot of people are living in cities but that all you know, we're in this country in the UK at least, or maybe not all in the UK, but you know, find a trail wherever you are. <laughs> there are trails everywhere. I, I quite often with the Japanese teams, like so I spent time with the professional teams and the university teams. There was this one place we used to train, which was concrete track, and there was a, a kind of gravel track next to it, which was much softer. And I was like, just just run there. It's like two meters away. And it's pretty flat. And they were like, no, we're running on the concrete. We're tra training for the races. I was like, guys, you know, and, yeah, and you're all injured. So, so anyways, that's, I think that's about, about half an hour. I was asked to talk, so I think I've done that well. So uh, if I hand back to the uh, master who's going to- uh, yeah. Thanks, Adaraland. That was great. Um, thank you very much. So now we can open it up to questions. Um, so if everybody would like to, if you click on the box where you see yourself, um, you might have three dots there. Um, or you can look down at the bottom of your screen and you'll see um, a box called reactions. And you can click on that and then you can raise your hand and I can look through to see if anyone would like to ask a question. And it can be, it doesn't even have to be about the books. It can be about, or it can be about writing or you know, I don't know, anything. Yeah. And also you have to have, I think you have to have your video on here to see if I can, to see if you raise your hand. Well, maybe someone can just unmute themselves and ask the first question. We can try it that way, because mm -hmm. it might be quite tricky. So if anyone would like to ask a question, just unmute yourself and then. Balaban, do you have a question? Could I make a comment rather than a question? Yes, please do. Having run the Cardiff Half Marathon twice, uh, it's worth noting it has a very long and very steep hill towards the end. So it's very hard to run your best time on, on, on that course. So that might explain why, why nobody managed to run under, under 64 minutes on, on that particular occasion. We do have, I see it in... Although can I just say that 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 race was the Reading half marathon, the, the trial. Oh, race. Reading was it? It wasn't. I thought I thought you said it was Cardiff, right? That okay. What they were trying to qualify for the Cardiff race. Ah, right. Okay. Well, Red, I've done Reading as well. That is a lot flatter. I grant. I grant you, it doesn't have that enormous hill. <laughs> Great, Dan. Would you like to ask a question, Dan? Just unmute yourself. Right. Okay. Uh, in Kenya. Where they have like the the races and what have you do they have many amateurs in the races or is it all like elite they're, they're half marathons they're, like we do over here is it always a completely yeah. different race maybe uh, yeah no it's, it's about 99 percent uh i wouldn't call them elite or, or professional because a lot of them are you know they're not actually earning any money they're, they're they're kind of there to try and impress an agent try and get a contract so a lot of the best runners won't run the races in kenya yeah. But, uh, but they're all serious. They're all training seriously. They're, they're kind of living in training camps. Uh, yeah, you don't get any, you get a few fun runners, but they're like, you know, it might be 5,000 people in the race and there might be 20. Yeah, not like the UK. 
So it's quite an intimidating atmosphere. I did run a, a cross country race there and I ended up dropping out because I think I'd been lapped by everybody in the field. Uh, um. and <laughs> it's quite intimidating to, to race there. But, but yeah, you, you get a couple, but usually not many. It, it, it's, it's considered running is not like an amateur thing. It's a serious thing. So they're all, they're, their obvious aims from there are to get like um, into races into, say, Europe and that where the prize money is and that type of thing. Is that their sort of goal, is it? Yeah, al almost every Kenyan athlete who's training. So there's probably, like I say, just in the 10, there's about 2,000. Then there's other areas nearby. Eldoret, there's probably another 1,000, another 1,000 in Kapdegat, Kericho. So there's probably about five, 6,000 serious athletes in Kenya, of which about probably two or 300 are getting races regularly abroad. So the rest of them, that's all, yeah, they're trying to get as close to the front of one of those races in Kenya as they can. Uh, I mean, if, you know, if they come top 20 in one of those races, you don't necessarily have to win it, but if you can come top 20, you're probably, <clears throat> you know, hopefully there's a, there's a, there's a manager around who's, yeah. but even if not a manager, even if it's an obscure race, you might have a, a, a serious athlete there who you've been men talked to who said, oh, I, I, you know, I was only two minutes behind you. He might say, I'll oh, come to my training camp. You know, you can, you can, you can hang out. A lot of these training camps have these other groups who live outside the training camp in very, very poor conditions. They've got no money. They turn up for the training and they just hope to kind of build it up enough to, to be able to hang with the group. So the actual manager of the group or the boss of the group says, OK, you, you're, you're looking good. You're looking like someone who might you know, have potential to come in. But what yeah. happens is a lot of them end up overtraining because they're trying to impress the whole time. And it's, it's very difficult. It's very difficult. There's no, you know, the system works because there's so many runners funneling through it, but a lot of runners are, are getting lost. And so I had a friend who his best time was 2.28, which he'd run in Kenya, which was never going to get him for a marathon, never going to get him any attention. But because I became his friend, I managed to get him a race, it got him to the Edinburgh Marathon. So he was like probably the slowest Kenyan runner I met of all of those runners. Yeah. And yet, given the chance, he got to Edinburgh Marathon. He came second around 216. So, you know, all, all those other guys have probably got that kind of potential. I mean, with a few exceptions. I did meet one or two Kenyans who were clearly deluded. Were like, I'm faster than you. What are you, what are you doing? But in general, you know, even the slowest guy is potentially, you know, top three in a, in a big European marathon. So... It's mm. it's quite incredible, yeah. The the level is is insane. <laughs> All right, thanks. Yeah, thank you, Dan. Thanks for your question, Steve. Would you like to ask a question? Steve, you unmute yourself. Steve, Seth. Yeah. Uh, Great. Go ahead. Hello. Um. Hi, other hands. Um. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, thanks a lot for the talk. It's uh, fascinating, as always, to hear um, hear you. Um, could you uh, could you say what the most uh, memorable running experience you've ever had uh, is, and who the most inspirational runner you've ever met is? Those two questions. Yeah, putting me on the spot. I mean, I, I mean, as much as I mean, there's definitely m m memorable moments. In the ultra running world, I mean, the, the I think from a personal point of view, running an ultra marathon, you get the intensity of the experience becomes so much greater. You know, when you've been going for, you know, you're hallucinating. You're in the mountains. It's dark, and you know, you've been going for 40 hours. I mean, the intensity. But from a so so that's from a kind of life experience point of view. But from from a purely running point of view, just being in the midst of a group of Kenyans, like hitting a fairly good pace. Obviously for them, it's super easy, but just to feel like you're flowing, you're easy, you're in this group. Once it starts getting serious, nobody starts talking. So there's this kind of being in a pack of 20, 30 Kenyans in silence. I mean, you know, knowing I'm gonna, I'm gonna lose it at some point, I'm going way beyond my means, but just for those few minutes when you're just hanging in there and you're feeling okay, it's just, I actually, it happened to me quite a lot while I was there, but I've been back a few times recently. And I kind of, I, at the time I got so commonplace that I got kind of took it by, I, I became complacent and, and kind of took it for granted. 
but I was back there about two years ago and I was, I was just on a run with another, another Westerner and this group came by and just for old times, I thought, I'm just going to carry on with them. And I suddenly remember that feeling of being, you know, the, there's a kind of unison of movement. It's, you kind of get carried along by the, by the, and they're such elegant movers. You just feel like, even though I may not have been, you feel like you're moving so easily and you're just in that group. So I'd say any of those great runs with the Kenyans is the most memorable. In terms of the most inspiring characters, I mean, I mean, the Kenyans are inspiring in that where they, you know, where they come from, but, but in terms of individuals in the ultra running, there were, well, there's that guy, Zach Miller. So I had, I had a great time with Zach Miller. And, and I, I, I don't know if you've seen this, someone just made a film about him called Zach. I'd look it up on, on YouTube. And I don't know what it is about Zach. He, he doesn't, he's not the best ultra runner. I mean, he's very good, but he's not the best. And, but he, what he does is he, gives it all from the gun which in ultra running is quite a crazy thing to do you know he is like pounding from from the start and you see him and you just think that is just crazy but he just keeps going and keeps going and normally spectacularly blows up and 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 doesn't do very well but occasionally hangs on and wins i find him incredibly inspiring and you know it's kind of hard to put your finger on why apart from that but there's something about his his honesty and his, his humbleness and his and then the other ultra runner who really was quite amazing to me was uh, Mira Ray. I don't know if anyone's heard of Mira Ray, but she's a, a Nepalese runner. And she was a child soldier uh, in the war, uh, the Maoist rebels. She was a Maoist rebel fighting the government uh, as a 14-year-old. As 13, 14, I think she joined when she was 13. And she's now an ultra runner. And, you know, I spoke to a lot of ultra runners and I would ask them about the pain cave and how you keep going and... And she was just like, she had the, she was amazing thing. I was like, how do you keep going when you, when you get into like difficulty, when you feel the pain? She was like, no, I never feel that. I just look around and think, wow, wow. <laughs> I was like, wow. And you've been, the things you've been through and, and you just have that positivity and that, and she just, and you know, she was just beaming from ear to ear the whole time I, I was with her and treating me like a really good friend. And, and she's just very inspiring. She's done huge things for, sport in Nepal, for women's sport particularly, because in, in Nepal, traditionally women, you know, it's really frowned on for them to do sport, where now you fly into Nepal, she was telling me, and there, there's posters of her and the little girls are saying, I want to be like Mira Ray when I grow up. So she's had a huge impact on, on, on women in her country and, and has now set up teams, ultra running teams in Nepal. And of course, you know, but like the Kenyans, the potential there is, is huge if, if that could become a thing with that with the mountains and the altitude and the poverty. So, uh, so yeah, she's a wonderfully inspiring person. So off the top of my head, I'd say Zach Miller and Mira Ray and, and just being in, in with a group of Kenyans for, for two minutes is, is long enough to carry you through. Thanks. Hello, Darahan. Hello. <laughs> you might remember me from a, a way of no, but uh, a question for you. Um, have you got another book in the pipeline or is the next book about uh, running in lockdown? Uh, yeah, I do. I remember I've got some great photos of you running like way steep in snow, haven't I? Yeah. <laughs> I remember it well. Uh, long story that. Uh, but yeah, no, I, I haven't got a book in the pipeline yet, but I did send two pitches to my editor today. Uh, so I've, I kind of have to sit on ideas for a long time before I'm sure, because when you undertake a book, it's obviously, it's a huge chunk of your life. You've got to be sure that you actually do want to, you know, pursue this. And so I've had a couple of ideas milling around for about a year, to be honest, and I finally committed to contacting my editor today. I don't really want to say what they are because until I get the feedback from him, but, uh, but then they're not about running in lockdown. Although I have been writing a lot. I've got a, uh, we mentioned my website earlier, thewayoftherunner.com. There is a blog on there, and I've been blogging what I call a lockdown diary or coronavirus diary. So I have been writing about running in lockdown, and it, it, it is an interesting, an interesting you know topic, really. I mean, I I found I I kind of realized only the other day I kind of realized that my entire life <clears throat> I've run since I was about eleven, but in some ways my running has always been 
in some ways training i've always had a goal i've always had a race or you know or whether you know not necessarily to win the race or, or to even run a time but just to finish a race but it's always been building towards something and suddenly with no races i'm just <clears throat> running for the fun of it and that was quite a weird feeling I, I don't have to go for this run i'm not training for anything but i still want to and and then in some ways it's kind of nice it's kind of brilliant to kind of get to that point where you think yeah i'm just gonna run because i enjoy running wow i mean i've always enjoyed running but it was that was kind of a byproduct of it. The, the fun was like a byproduct. Where now it's, if it's not fun, I don't, I'm not going to do it. So it is fun. So, yeah. But there's a lot to say about it. But that's not what I'm going to write a book about, no. <laughs> Thank you. Well, oh, thanks, Adaranand. Um, I think our time is up. Uh, okay. Almost an hour now. That's been very inspiring. Um, we've had so many great comments in the chat. Uh, people have really got a lot from your talk. Very, very inspiring. Of course, we encourage everyone to go to your website, The Way of the Runner, listen to your podcasts, and look forward to your new book whenever it is coming out. Uh, okay, well, thank you for having me. It's been fun. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. And to everyone uh, listening, we'd like to thank you for joining us. I uh, hope you got some inspiration. It's a difficult time for so many of us, and hopefully Adara Nunn's talk has offered some inspiration. And we look forward to seeing you again soon at our next event. So all the best to everyone. Happy New Year. And once again, thanks, Adara Nand. And Thank yes, you. again, the recording of this will be available on the Run and Become website very soon. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Cheers. Bye. Bye.